Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. This week will be a regular old Apollo style MUN mission, but with an aquatic twist. Yes, here at Laun Aerospace we've been having quite a lot of noise complaints from local residents, stating that our rockets are too loud. We've also had some run-ins with health and safety officials who feel that the KSC launch pad is far too close to the facility buildings for safe rocket launches. And so, a solution was required, and today we'll be showcasing that solution. The very first Laun Aerospace Sea Launch Operation. Sea launches are actually a fairly hot topic right now, as SpaceX recently acquired two oil rigs to convert into sea launch platforms for their upcoming Starship vehicle, and of course China begun its sea launch operations in the latter half of last year with its Long March 11 rocket. A sea launch platform has a few benefits. The launch pad can be sailed to the planet's equator, where the rotational speed is at its greatest, providing an additional launch boost. They also mean that plane change maneuvers aren't needed for achieving geostationary orbit, since the launch pad can be positioned to negate the need for one, or alternatively could be positioned to enable launch into any specific orbital inclination as well. For today's mission, I'm not going to try and sail the launch platform to any specific location, just get it far enough away from the space center to allow our residents to sleep in peace. 20 kilometers or so should do the trick, I think. I decided to make things a little bit more challenging by having the vessel transport the rocket in a horizontal position, and then having a system to reorient the rocket into a vertical position for takeoff when we're at the launch site, which is a far more realistic option than just transporting the entire rocket in an upright position. Unfortunately, the hinges in KSP aren't really powerful enough to lift such a heavy mass on their own, so I've devised a system of pistons and an aerospike engine to flip the rocket into launch configuration. I didn't really want to compromise too much on the rocket itself, so instead of going for some weedy, low in orbit small sat launcher, I decided to go all out with a three crew capacity MUN rocket, which has a separate moon landing vehicle like the mighty Saturn V did. We also have every science experiment in the game, apart from the Science Junior and I think the scanning arm, so that the mission will actually yield some useful data for us, rather than just serve as a flex to showcase the sea launch platform, which I must stress it definitely also is. <laughs> but speaking of both the rocket and the sea launch platform, it looks like both are completed, so we can start driving this towards the ocean. Yes, obviously we have to deploy it on land, either the runway or the launch pad, so I decided to uh, fit it out with some big wheels to drive it towards the ocean and uh, and uh, I guess launch it. One thing you've got to be careful with is that these wheels are very prone to braking, so you've got to go nice and slowly. I have sped the footage up just for your own, you know, sanity, but bear in mind that you don't drive as quickly as this footage makes out I'm, I'm driving. You've got to go nice and slow because these wheels are very fragile, and of course, wheel repair now requires a finite resource, so you are trying to avoid breaking the wheels if you can. Luckily, we got to the ocean in mostly one piece. We did have a couple of casualties, but by and large, we made it. Once we're in the water, we can ditch those. Uh, <laughs> they're kind of constructed out of solid rocket motors, uh, and obviously the wheels as well. We can ditch those and fire up our three Goliath engines on the boat. Yes, okay, I, I, I kind of put all the emphasis on the actual mechanism to launch the rocket and the rocket itself. I didn't put that much thought into the actual design of the boat, so it's a bit, it's a bit rubbish really, isn't it? And it does seem to hop and skip and jump a little bit as we pick up speed in the water, and it, didn't, it kept on wanting to seem to turn to the left, so in the end I had to disable one of our Goliath engines just to make sure we held a straight course. Uh, kind of weird, really, because when I tested this boat out with everything being the same as it is here, it seemed to work fine with all three Goliath engines running. So I'm not quite sure why it suddenly wanted to list to the left. So when you download this craft file, or I should say, if you download this craft file from the description and try it out yourself, you may not need to disable one of the Goliath engines like I needed to. Your mileage may vary. And here we are playing the footage back extremely quickly as we head out to sea. Uh, the boat doesn't really move anywhere fast, so I decided to just speed up the footage to save you guys the boredom so we can get to the launch a little bit quicker. Uh, but I wanted to go, you know, a fair amount out to sea just to prove that this thing is a worthy ocean-going vessel, and I think... Here is a good a spot as any to uh, start thinking about deploying the rocket. Well, I'm not deploying the rocket, but reorienting the rocket into launch configuration. So the first thing I'm going to do is right click the command pod through the fairing and press control from here. And then we're going to 
press the action group. I can't even remember which action group it is that fires up that cal controller. Um, just check the action groups when you download this craft, and you'll see whichever one uh, toggles play on the cal controller. That's what you've got to press. Anyway, uh, I think I was just sorting out the stage and just there. Are we doing it? Yes, we are. So we've got these pistons here that raise the rocket up gradually. And then as the rocket approaches vertical position, we can fire up the aero spike just to bring it that last bit of the way. I did have a docking port there. That my, the plan was that the docking ports would dock to each other and then the rocket would stay upright. But they didn't seem to want to play ball. So I let the rocket wobble up into an upright point and then quickly press launch. So we're going to do it. Yep, just as the aero spike runs out of fuel, we can launch and a slight destruction on the... Uh, on the ship deck just there. Luckily the boat itself wasn't really damaged. It was just one of the structural panels that the rocket was attached to. I guess you could say it was like an ablative launch pad. Uh, if we were talking about this as if it was a real launch platform. We had loud We put some ablative material underneath the rocket that was going to get destroyed upon launch. Um, in order to protect the rest of the vessel. So you can just go with that as your head cannon for the launch. And we can all just pretend that I designed a really really good launch system. Anyway. Here is the rocket, and you can see it's powered by a single vector engine. Uh, no real reason, really, just the vector provided a nice small profile. I wanted to keep the rocket as short as possible, but the vector engine, uh, while being nice and small in profile, also has a fair amount of thrust. It, it provides good thrust to weight ratio, basically. I did tone some of the gimbal down because, really, they get, they have too much. They have too much gimbal uh, for anything that isn't a space shuttle. So I like to turn the gimbal limit down of the vector engines whenever I use them for an application that isn't, I don't know, a Falcon 9 or space shuttle replica or anything that necessitates having a high gimbal range. Although, of course, the vector engine is now long gone. We are on our upper stage. It's a poodle engine. It's going to perform our Kerbin circularization. Well, actually, I, I shouldn't say that because it's not going to perform our Kerbin circularization. It's going to do the vast majority of our Kerbin circularization. There goes the launch escape system, by the way. It's going to perform the vast majority of our Kerbin circularization. But right before we reach stable orbit, we're going to ditch it just so that it ends up crashing back down to the surface of Kerbin and doesn't get left in space. And then we're going to use the Terrier engine of the command and service module to perform the rest of our circularization and then get us on an encounter with the MUN, circularize at the MUN, etc. We're going to use this engine for everything else, except of course the MUN landing, which is going to be done by the engine on the MUN lander, rather unsurprisingly. Uh, that was a horrible uh, piece of dialogue just there, but I hope I got whatever message I was trying to get across, across. Anyway, I said right at the beginning that this was going to be an Apollo-style moon mission, and that's because we've kind of reconfigured the vessel uh, much like the Saturn V setup was, where we had to uh, flip the command and service module around and dock with the uh, MUN lander, which was situated between the command and service module and the lower stage. Obviously, this is nothing like the Saturn V. It was only two stages to orbit, nearly, most, uh, first of all. And also, the Saturn V wasn't launched from a boat, and the MUN lander itself is only one seat, not two seats. There's quite a lot of differences, basically, between this and the Apollo missions. But in terms of it having a separate moon lander, and of course, having the moon lander situated below the command and service module, I feel like it's close enough where I can say that this is an Apollo-style mission. I guess, you know, Apollo is a Greek god, right? So maybe we could have called this a Poseidon-style mission, right? Because it's named after a Greek god. But Poseidon, obviously god of the sea, this was launched from the sea, how poetic that would have been. I think I called this Laszlo in my head, because it's like Laun, aerospace, sea launch operation. Uh, Poseidon would have been better. Uh, past Matt, if you're watching this, <laughs> uh, there you go. Call it Poseidon. Anyway, that we have our moon encounter. I'm not quite sure when any of that just was. We're going to just time warp down to Periapsis and execute the maneuver node. Uh, not great thrust rate ratio with this Terrier engine, but our overall mass is not too great, so it doesn't take that long to perform the burn. At this point, I realized I'd forgotten to deploy our solar panels, so whoops, we can still deploy them in a second. Luckily, it wasn't an issue because our, our MUN lander has, uh, I guess, rigid solar panels, ones that don't need to deploy. So that was how we were able to maintain our electric charge. But obviously, once we deploy or separate the moon lander, I should say, uh, we're going to want to deploy those panels to make sure that our command module remains powered, which we now have, so it was all fine. And another whoops, I forgot to put Jeb back onto the 
command module. Not a big deal, I guess, but it meant that he had a pretty lonely voyage up to the Mun. Uh, Bill and Bob happily together in the command module, but Jeb was sort of on his own in the lander can. Sorry, Jeb. Don't worry, he'll be able to board the command pod once he's done his Mun landing. And here we go. Now, minor spoiler alert, guys. I found a Mun arch, like, naturally, which I didn't think happened to anyone. Like, I thought to find Mun arches, you basically, like, have to know where the Mun arch is or use scanning tech to find a surface anomaly. But there, on the horizon, is a Mun arch found organically. Am I one of the first people to find a Mun arch naturally? Probably not. That's very arrogant of me. But I thought it was kind of a nice, pleasant surprise. I didn't know there was a Mun arch in that location, so it's kind of cool, like, oh, I found a Mun Arch the way Squad intended the Mun Arches to be found. I know you can detect them now using scanning tech, but back, back in day, when Mun Arches were first added, there was no such thing as scanning tech. You basically just had to find Easter eggs just by finding them, or, or like, going, googling where they were and going to those exact coordinates. Uh, but there you go, there's a, there's a Mun Arch. I guess we've got the Delta V in our lander to actually hop toward it, but really, the focus of this mission was the sea launch platform. I'm just now validating the actual rocket itself and confirming that it can do the mission I designed it to do. And of course, we can plant our Laon aerospace flag on the surface of the Mun, most important part of this mission. And it turned out I'd accidentally managed to land in a biome that I'd never landed on, uh, landed in, <laughs> in this save file. So I actually managed to get some useful science data. Normally when I do a MUN mission in my Laon Aerospace save, I don't really get any science points because I've done so many missions to the MUN in this save file that, you know, we don't really have any science left to gain. But on this occasion I managed to gain a little bit of science. That was a nice, that was a nice bonus. I mean, it's pointless because we have a full We've unlocked the tech tree completely, and this isn't a career mode save, so there's not much value in gaining more science points than you need to unlock the tech tree. But I guess it does contribute to your overall uh, score. I think that's what the kids do, isn't it? When you've beaten the tech tree, you just can continue to build up science points to contribute towards your uh, overall score. But I don't really bother doing that, because half the time I forget to store the science experiments that I did in missions, or I don't recover the vessel or something like that, so I don't tend to bother <laughs> in this particular save file. But who knows, maybe I've got a pretty good score at this point because I've been playing on this save file since 2019. So I must have racked up a fair amount of points at this at this stage. Anyway, as you can see, we have ascended from the surface of the Mun, and I'm just fine-tuning our circularization maneuver node that's not only going to get us circularized around the Mun, but also going to get us a nice close encounter with the command and service module so that we can reunite our space frogs. Uh, I'm sure Bill and Bob miss Jeb dearly at this point because he's not been in the command and service module since low Kerbin orbit. In fact, he transferred to the lander can before even achieving stable low Kerbin orbit. So it's been quite some time since our crew members have seen each other. So I'm sure this is a very emotional reunion for both parties. So we can start burning towards uh, the uh, command module. Now I'm going to perform the uh, quote unquote loun lazy method of docking. Basically, I'm going to just uh, switch to each vessel separately, target the other vessel's docking port, and then use auto SAS to kind of keep the two vessels locked towards each other's docking port. And as you can see, uh, they drift towards each other really, really nicely. And even though we're slightly misaligned, they automatically rotate so that the docking ports continue to face each other. So that docking, it was really easy basically. We didn't need to use any monopropellant or RCS or any kind of other adjustment maneuvers. Anyway, as you can see, before I forget to talk about it, I've got Jebediah on EVA just so that we can take all of the data from our lander can so that we can store it on the command module because we're not going to be taking the lander can back with us. We've only got two parachutes on the command pod, which means we don't really have enough kind of stopping power to land safely with the Mun lander attached. What we're going to do once I've eventually got Jeb back on board the command module is we're going to perform a retrograde burn using our Terrier engine just to drop our periapsis into the surface of the Mun. We're then going to get rid of our lander can and then quickly accelerate so that our periapsis is once again above the surface of the Mun. That way our command module stays in orbit, which would be nice but the lander can itself will crash into the surface of the mun and be destroyed and not get left cluttering up low mun orbit potentially causing a hazardous obstacle for any future missions to the mun or indeed our mun space station which admittedly is in a completely different orbit to that lander can so there was no risk of it impacting it but still you know it's just nice for cleanliness sake for the space polar bears space dolphins 
all of the animals up here, really, uh, that there's no junk floating around in orbit. And there we have it. We have our Kerbin encounter. Our parapsis is nice and low, such that we're not going to, you know, enter the atmosphere and then subsequently leave it. We're going to decelerate enough that we're going to just land. So now there's not much left to do other than uh, ditch the service module. So we just got the command pod left. A little bit of a close encounter with one of our solar panels. It was no big deal. Don't worry about it, guys. And then we can just time warp down uh, until our parachutes deploy. Now, of course, normally at this point in a Kerbal Space Program video, I would start wrapping the video up. But of course, we still have one more thing left to do in this mission. Once we've uh, landed, let's just speed the footage right up so we can get to our touchdown because we need to get our boat back to the Kerbal Space Center. Our Kerbals have returned from their brave, brave space mission, but now we need to get our nautical Kerbals back to shore. Uh, we can't really get the boat itself at to the Kerbal Space Center because it, it, it's a boat, right? It's going to be stuck in the sea. We can at the very least get them back home and they can just disembark the vessel and dry off, you know, have a shower, do whatever it is Kerbals do when they're not in space, probably think about going to space. So we can just lower the masts for no real reason other than the fact it looks neater. And then very, very slowly rotate it on the spot. I've sped the footage up quite a bit here. And then with the footage continued to be sped up, we're going to uh, drive or sail, I should say, back towards the Kerbal Space Center. So yeah, very, very fast footage playback here because it's not the most interesting thing in the world to watch. And I couldn't really use uh, high physics time warp because otherwise the boat would just sort of hop, skip and jump a bit too much and uh, would break in the water. So a bit of a boring process for me. I say that like I had to do anything. I basically just targeted the space center and then just went and did something else for a bit and then just came back to make sure the boat had reached its destination, which it has. It is ashore, which means that the mission is definitely over for real this time. We know it's over because there's an end screen in place. The left is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm from my channel. Uh, the right hand side is my most recent upload, probably a space this week, statistically speaking. Subscribe and there's Patreon as well. I've run out of video to talk over now, so that's it. Goodbye.